Chapter One, Part Two of the Lifted Veil. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The Lifted Veil by George Eliot. Chapter One, Part Two. Shortly after this last occurrence, I think the very next day, I began to be aware of a phase in my abnormal sensibility to which, from the languid and slight nature of my intercourse with others since my illness, I had not been alive before. This was the obtrusion on my mind of the mental process going forward in first one person and then another with whom I happened to be in contact. The vagrant, frivolous ideas and emotions of some uninteresting acquaintance, Mrs. Fillmore, for example, would force themselves on my consciousness like an importunate, ill-played musical instrument, or the loud activity of an imprisoned insect. But this unpleasant sensibility was fitful, and left me moments of rest, when the souls of my companions were once more shut out from me, and I felt a relief such as silence brings to wearied nerves. I might have believed this importunate insight to be merely a diseased activity of the imagination, but that my prevision of incalculable words and actions proved it to have a fixed relation to the mental process in other minds. But this superadded consciousness, wearying and annoying enough when it urged on me the trivial experience of indifferent people, became an intense pain and grief when it seemed to be opening to me the souls of those who were in a close relation to me when the rational talk, the graceful attentions, the wittily turned phrases, and the kindly deeds, which used to make the web of their characters, were seen as if thrust asunder by a microscopic vision that showed all the intermediate frivolities, all the suppressed egoism, all the struggling chaos of puerilities, meanness, vague capricious memories, and indolent makeshift thoughts, from which human words and deeds emerge like leaflets covering a fermenting heap. At Basel we were joined by my brother Alfred, now a handsome self-confident man of six and twenty, a thorough contrast to my fragile, nervous, ineffectual self. I believe I was held to have a sort of half-womanish, half-ghostly beauty, for the portrait painters, who are thick as weeds at Geneva, had often asked me to sit to them, and I had been the model of a dying minstrel in a fancy picture. But I thoroughly disliked my own physique, and nothing but the belief that it was a condition of poetic genius would have reconciled me to it. That brief hope was quite fled, and I saw in my face now nothing but the stamp of a morbid organization framed for passive suffering, too feeble for the sublime resistance of poetic production. Alfred, from whom I had been almost constantly separated, and who, in his present stage of character and appearance, came before me as a perfect stranger, was bent on being extremely friendly and brother-like to me. He had the superficial kindness of a good-humoured, self-satisfied nature that fears no rivalry and has encountered no contrarieties. I am not sure that my disposition was good enough for me to have been quite free from envy towards him, even if our desires had not clashed, and if I had been in the healthy human condition which admits of generous confidence and charitable construction. There must always have been an antipathy between our natures. As it was, he became in a few weeks an object of intense hatred to me, and when he entered the room, still more when he spoke, it was as if a sensation of grating metal had set my teeth on edge. My diseased consciousness was more intensely and continually occupied with his thoughts and emotions than with those of any other person who came in my way. I was perpetually exasperated with the petty promptings of his conceit and his love of patronage, with his self-complacent belief in Bertha Grant's passion for him, with his half-pitying contempt for me, seen not in the ordinary indications of intonation and phrase and slight action which an acute and suspicious mind is on the watch for, but in all their naked, skinless complication. 
for we were rivals, and our desires clashed, though he was not aware of it. I have said nothing yet of the effect Bertha Grant produced in me on a nearer acquaintance. That effect was chiefly determined by the fact that she made the only exception among all the human beings about me to my unhappy gift of insight. About Bertha I was always in a state of uncertainty. I could watch the expression of her face and speculate on its meaning. I could ask for her opinion with the real interest of ignorance. I could listen for her words and watch for her smile with hope and fear. She had for me the fascination of an unraveled destiny. I say it was this fact that chiefly determined the strong effect she produced on me, for in the abstract no womanly character could seem to have less affinity for that of a shrinking, romantic, passionate youth than Bertha's. She was keen, sarcastic, unimaginative, prematurely cynical, remaining critical and unmoved in the most impressive scenes, inclined to dissect all my favorite poems, and especially contemptuous towards the German lyrics which were my pet literature at that time. To this moment I am unable to define my feeling towards her. It was not ordinary boyish admiration, for she was the very opposite, even to the color of her hair, of the ideal woman who still remained to me the type of loveliness. And she was without that enthusiasm for the great and good, which even at the moment of her strongest dominion over me I should have declared to be the highest element of character. But there is no tyranny more complete than that which a self-centered negative nature exercises over a morbidly sensitive nature perpetually craving sympathy and support. The most independent people feel the effect of a man's silence in heightening their value for his opinion, feel an additional triumph in conquering the reverence of a critic habitually captious and satirical. No wonder, then, that an enthusiastic, self-distrusting youth should watch and wait before the closed secret of a sarcastic woman's face, as if it were the shrine of the doubtfully benignant deity who ruled his destiny. For a young enthusiast is unable to imagine the total negation in another mind of the emotions which are stirring his own. They may be feeble, latent, inactive, he thinks, but they are there. They may be called forth. Sometimes, in moments of happy hallucination, he believes they may be there in all the greater strength because he sees no outward sign of them. And this effect, as I have intimated, was heightened to its utmost intensity in me because Bertha was the only being who remained for me in the mysterious seclusion of soul that renders such youthful delusion possible. Doubtless there was another sort of fascination at work, that subtle physical attraction which delights in cheating our psychological predictions, and in compelling the men who paint sylphs to fall in love with some bonne et brave femme, heavy-heeled and freckled. Bertha's behavior towards me was such as to encourage all my illusions, to heighten my boyish passion, and make me more and more dependent on her smiles. Looking back with my present wretched knowledge, I conclude that her vanity and love of power were intensely gratified by the belief that I had fainted on first seeing her purely from the strong impression her person had produced on me. The most prosaic woman likes to believe herself the object of a violent, a poetic passion, and without a grain of romance in her, Bertha had that spirit of intrigue which gave piquancy to the idea that the brother of the man she meant to marry was dying with love and jealousy for her sake. That she meant to marry my brother was what at that time I did not believe for though he was assiduous in his attentions to her, and I knew well enough that both he and my father had made up their minds to this result, there was not yet an understood engagement, there had been no explicit declaration, and Bertha habitually, while she flirted with my brother and accepted his homage in a way that implied to him a thorough recognition of its intention, made me believe by the subtlest looks and phrases, feminine nothings which could never be quoted against her, 
that he was really the object of her secret ridicule that she thought him as i did a coxcomb whom she would have pleasure in disappointing me she openly petted in my brother's presence as if i were too young and sickly ever to be thought of as a lover and that was the view he took of me but i believe she must inwardly have delighted in the tremors into which she threw me by the coaxing way in which she patted my curls while she laughed at my quotations such caresses were always given in the presence of our friends for when we were alone together she affected a much greater distance towards me and now and then took the opportunity by words or slight actions to stimulate my foolish timid hope that she really preferred me and why should she not follow her inclination i was not in so advantageous a position as my brother but i had fortune i was not a year younger than she was and she was an heiress who would soon be of age to decide for herself the fluctuations of hope and fear confined to this one channel made each day in her presence a delicious torment there was one deliberate act of hers which especially helped to intoxicate me when we were at vienna her twentieth birthday occurred and as she was very fond of ornaments we all took the opportunity of the splendid jewellers shops in that teutonic paris to purchase her a birthday present of jewellery mine naturally was the least expensive it was an opal ring the opal was my favorite stone because it seems to blush and turn pale as if it had a soul i told bertha so when i gave it her and said that it was an emblem of the poetic nature changing with the changing light of heaven and of woman's eyes in the evening she appeared elegantly dressed and wearing conspicuously all the birthday presents except mine i looked eagerly at her fingers but saw no opal i had no opportunity of noticing this to her during the evening but the next day when i found her seated near the window alone after breakfast i said you scorn to wear my poor opal i should have remembered that you despised poetic natures and should have given you coral or turquoise or some other opaque unresponsive stone do i despise it she answered taking hold of a delicate gold chain which she always wore round her neck and drawing out the end from her bosom with my ring hanging to it it hurts me a little i can tell you she said with her usual dubious smile to wear it in that secret place and since your poetical nature is so stupid as to prefer a more public position i shall not endure the pain any longer she took off the ring from the chain and put it on her finger smiling still while the blood rushed to my cheeks and i could not trust myself to say a word of entreaty that she would keep the ring where it was before i was completely fooled by this and for two days shut myself up in my own room whenever bertha was absent that i might intoxicate myself afresh with the thought of this scene and all that it implied i should mention that during these two months which seemed a long life to me from the novelty and intensity of the pleasures and pains i underwent my diseased anticipation in other people's consciousness continued to torment me now it was my father and now my brother now mrs fillmore or her husband and now our german courier whose stream of thought rushed upon me like a ringing in the ears not to be got rid of though it allowed my own impulses and ideas to continue their uninterrupted course it was like a preternaturally heightened sense of hearing making audible to one a roar of sound where others find perfect stillness the weariness and disgust of this involuntary intrusion into other souls was counteracted only by my ignorance of bertha and my growing passion for her a passion enormously stimulated if not produced by that ignorance she was my oasis of mystery in the dreary desert of knowledge i had never allowed my diseased condition to betray itself or to drive me into any unusual speech or action except once when in a moment of peculiar bitterness against my brother i had forestalled some words which i knew he was going to utter 
a clever observation which he had prepared beforehand. He had occasionally a slightly affected hesitation in his speech, and when he paused an instant after the second word, my impatience and jealousy impelled me to continue the speech for him as if it were something we had both learned by rote. He colored and looked astonished as well as annoyed, and the words had no sooner escaped my lips than I felt a shock of alarm lest such an anticipation of words, very far from being words of course easy to divine, should have betrayed me as an exceptional being, a sort of quiet energumen whom every one, Bertha above all, would shudder at and avoid. But I magnified as usual the impression any word or deed of mine could produce on others, for no one gave any sign of having noticed my interruption as more than a rudeness to be forgiven me on the score of my feeble nervous condition. While this superadded consciousness of the actual was almost constant with me, I had never had a recurrence of that distinct prevision which I have described in relation to my first interview with Bertha and I was waiting with eager curiosity to know whether or not my vision of Prague would prove to have been an instance of the same kind. A few days after the incident of the opal ring, we were paying one of our frequent visits to the Lichtenberg Palace. I could never look at many pictures in succession, for pictures, when they are at all powerful, affect me so strongly that one or two exhaust all my capability of contemplation. This morning I had been looking at Giorgione's picture of the cruel-eyed woman, said to be a likeness of Lucrezia Borgia. I had stood long alone before it, fascinated by the terrible reality of that cunning, relentless face, till I felt a strange, poisoned sensation, as if I had long been inhaling a fatal odor and was just beginning to be conscious of its effects. Perhaps even then I should not have moved away if the rest of the party had not returned to this room and announced that they were going to the Belvedere Gallery to settle a bet which had arisen between my brother and Mr. Fillmore about a portrait. I followed them dreamily and was hardly alive to what occurred till they had all gone up to the gallery, leaving me below, for I refused to come within sight of another picture that day. I made my way to the Grand Terrace, since it was agreed that we should saunter in the gardens when the dispute had been decided. I had been sitting here a short space, vaguely conscious of trim gardens with a city and green hills in the distance, when, wishing to avoid the proximity of the sentinel, I rose and walked down the broad stone steps, intending to seat myself farther on in the gardens. Just as I reached the gravel walk, I felt an arm slipped within mine, and a light hand gently pressing my wrist. In the same instant a strange, intoxicating numbness passed over me, like the continuance or climax of the sensation I was still feeling from the gaze of Lucrezia Borgia. The gardens, the summer sky, the consciousness of Bertha's arm being within mine all vanished and I seemed to be suddenly in darkness, out of which there gradually broke a dim firelight, and I felt myself sitting in my father's leather chair in the library at home. I knew the fireplace, the dogs for the wood fire, the black marble chimney-piece with the white marble medallion of the dying Cleopatra in the center. Intense and hopeless misery was pressing on my soul. The light became stronger, for Bertha was entering with a candle in her hand. Bertha, my wife, with cruel eyes, with green jewels and green leaves on her white ball dress, every hateful thought within her present to me. Madman, idiot, why don't you kill yourself then? It was a moment of hell. I saw into her pitiless soul, saw its barren worldliness, its scorching hate, and felt it clothe me round like an air I was obliged to breathe. She came with her candle and stood over me with a bitter smile of contempt. I saw the great emerald brooch on her bosom, a studded serpent with diamond eyes. I shuddered. 
I despised this woman with the barren soul and mean thoughts, but I felt helpless before her as if she clutched my bleeding heart, and would clutch it till the last drop of life-blood ebbed away. She was my wife, and we hated each other. Gradually the hearth, the dim library, the candlelight disappeared, seemed to melt away into a background of light, the green serpent with the diamond eyes remaining a dark image on the retina. Then I had a sense of my eyelids quivering, and the living daylight broke in upon me. I saw gardens and heard voices. I was seated on the steps of the Belvedere Terrace, and my friends were round me. The tumult of mind into which I was thrown by this hideous vision made me ill for several days and prolonged our stay at Vienna. I shuddered with horror as the scene recurred to me, and it recurred constantly, with all its minutiae, as if they had been burnt into my memory. And yet, such is the madness of the human heart under the influence of its immediate desires, I felt a wild, hell-braving joy that Bertha was to be mine. For the fulfillment of my former prevision concerning her first appearance before me left me little hope that this last hideous glimpse of the future was the mere diseased play of my own mind and had no relation to external realities. One thing alone I looked towards as a possible means of casting doubt on my terrible conviction, the discovery that my vision of Prague had been false, and Prague was the next city on our route. Meanwhile I was no sooner in Bertha's society again than I was as completely under her sway as before. What if I saw into the heart of Bertha the matured woman, Bertha my wife? Bertha the girl was a fascinating secret to me still. I trembled under her touch. I felt the witchery of her presence. I yearned to be assured of her love. The fear of poison is feeble against the sense of thirst. Nay, I was just as jealous of my brother as before, just as much irritated by his small patronizing ways, for my pride, my diseased sensibility, were there as they had always been, and winced as inevitably under every offense as my eye winced from an intruding moat. The future even when brought within the compass of feeling by a vision that made me shudder, had still no more than the force of an idea compared with the force of present emotion, of my love for Bertha, of my dislike and jealousy towards my brother. It is an old story that men sell themselves to the tempter and sign a bond with their blood because it is only to take effect at a distant day then rush on to snatch the cup their souls thirst after with an impulse not the less savage because there is a dark shadow beside them for evermore. There is no shortcut, no patent tram-road to wisdom. After all the centuries of invention, the soul's path lies through the thorny wilderness which must be still trodden in solitude, with bleeding feet, with sobs for help, as it was trodden by them of old time. My mind speculated eagerly on the means by which I should become my brother's successful rival, for I was still too timid in my ignorance of Bertha's actual feeling to venture on any step that would urge from her an avowal of it. I thought I should gain confidence even for this if my vision of Prague proved to have been veracious, and yet the horror of that certitude. Behind the slim girl Bertha, whose words and looks I watched for, whose touch was bliss, there stood continually that Bertha with the fuller form, the harder eyes, the more rigid mouth, with the barren, selfish soul laid bare, no longer a fascinating secret, but a measured fact urging itself perpetually on my unwilling sight. Are you unable to give me your sympathy, you who read this? Are you unable to imagine this double consciousness at work within me, flowing on like two parallel streams, which never mingle their waters and blend into a common hue? 
yet you must have known something of the presentiments that spring from an insight at war with passion and my visions were only like presentiments intensified to horror you have known the powerlessness of ideas before the might of impulse and my visions when once they had passed into memory were mere ideas pale shadows that beckoned in vain while my hand was grasped by the living and the loved in after days i thought with bitter regret that if i had foreseen something more or something different if instead of that hideous vision which poisoned the passion it could not destroy or if even along with it i could have had a foreshadowing of that moment when i looked on my brother's face for the last time some softening influence would have been shed over my feeling towards him pride and hatred would surely have been subdued into pity and the record of those hidden sins would have been shortened but this is one of the vain thoughts with which we men flatter ourselves we try to believe that the egoism within us would have easily been melted and that it was only the narrowness of our knowledge which hemmed in our generosity our awe our human piety and hindered them from submerging our hard indifference to the sensations and emotions of our fellows our tenderness and self-renunciation seem strong when our egoism has had its day when after our mean striving for a triumph that is to be another's loss the triumph comes suddenly and we shudder at it because it is held out by the chill hand of death our arrival in prague happened at night and i was glad of this for it seemed like a deferring of a terribly decisive moment to be in the city for hours without seeing it as we were not to remain long in prague but to go on speedily to dresden it was proposed that we should drive out the next morning and take a general view of the place as well as visit some of its specially interesting spots before the heat became oppressive for we were in august and the season was hot and dry but it happened that the ladies were rather late at their morning toilet and to my father's politely repressed but perceptible annoyance we were not in the carriage till the morning was far advanced i thought with a sense of relief as we entered the jews quarter where we were to visit the old synagogue that we should be kept in this flat shut-up part of the city until we should all be too tired and too warm to go farther and so we should return without seeing more than the streets through which we had already passed that would give me another day's suspense suspense the only form in which a fearful spirit knows the solace of hope but as i stood under the blackened groined arches of that old synagogue made dimly visible by the seven thin candles in the sacred lamp while our jewish cicerone reached down the book of the law and read to us in its ancient tongue i felt a shuddering impression that this strange building with its shrunken lights this surviving withered remnant of medieval judaism was of a piece with my vision those darkened dusty christian saints with their loftier arches and their larger candles needed the consolatory scorn with which they might point to a more shriveled death in life than their own as i expected when we left the jews quarter the elders of our party wished to return to the hotel but now instead of rejoicing in this as i had done beforehand i felt a sudden overpowering impulse to go on at once to the bridge and put an end to the suspense i had been wishing to protract i declared with unusual decision that i would get out of the carriage and walk on alone they might return without me my father thinking this merely a sample of my usual poetic nonsense objected that i should only do myself harm by walking in the heat but when i persisted he said angrily that i might follow my own absurd devices but that schmidt our courier must go with me i assented to this and set off with schmidt towards the bridge i had no sooner passed from under the archway of the grand old gate leading on to the bridge than a trembling seized me 
and I turned cold under the midday sun. Yet I went on. I was in search of something, a small detail which I remembered with special intensity as part of my vision. There it was, the patch of rainbow light on the pavement transmitted through a lamp in the shape of a star. End of chapter 1